Hello, my name is Vasilisa. Welcome to my channel about brain research. Thank you for watching. So today we with Professor Dr. Hervé Cadio will talk about the link between brain research and space research. Actually, we already have done one episode together where Professor Cadio explained the basics of sensation he talked uh, about uh, truths and myths uh, about olfaction and magnetoreception. And today we will continue our talk about magnetoreception too. If you missed our episode, so here is the link. <laughs> Nice to meet you again, uh, Vasilisa. It's a really a pleasure. I really enjoy talking. Thank you very much. It's it's absolutely the <laughs> same uh, for me. So, about space and about brain. Uh, not so long ago, I have seen your photos in Grenoble uh, at the European uh, Synchrotron Radiation Facility. So this is the place where the Large uh, Hadron uh, Collider is. No, that's not the Large Hadron Collider is. It's another place. <laughs> I, already love, I like how it works. <laughs> so it, tell it, me the it, truth. <laughs> it's, an, it's another place. The Large Hadron Collider is in Geneva um, mm -hmm. or close to it. This is... Um, this is in Grenoble, and I have to say this was an amazing experience. Let let me talk to you about that. It was not a touristic trip. It, oh, <laughs> touristic! Oh, I, it was certainly out of this world. Um, it's we're changing, you know, scale on science. Um, so I, I have to tell you the story behind that. So. Yes. Uh, we talked last time about magnetoreception and how animals can detect the Earth's magnetic field. There are several hypotheses. One is based on cryptochrome uh, with a radical pair mechanism. So cryptochrome are uh, photosensitive radical, while some of them are photosensitive. And when they are photosensitive, when they are photoactivated and they go to different quantic states, and then magnetic field. Um, is altering the transition between the different quantic states. Another Belzema on my heart because <laughs> I'm a chemist and I You're a chemist. A lot about these quantum states. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I told last time about the story about that some chemical reactions are, are magnetosensitive. And um, that was a, the pioneering work of uh, Klaus Scholten in the, um, in the 70s. Um, but so another hypothesis to explain magnetoreception, and it's an hypothesis dear to my heart, is that um, you have within cells, you have small crystal of magnetite. And maybe last time we talked about magnetotactic bacteria. Yes, okay. exactly. And yeah, this is a source of an enjoyment and amazement. Um, the, so one hypothesis is that these cells contain tiny crystal of a ferromagnetic material called magnetite. And these magnetite, um, when um, the magnetic field change, will um, change the orientation of the crystal, and then it will pull maybe some ion channel, um, so, um, and the ions will enter the cells, causing a depolarization, a receptor potential, and then an action potential. So that's one, that's one hypothesis I'm working on. Um, an interesting thing is that um, our research done in the lab have shown that the ions um, can detect the Earth's magnetic field. They are devoid of cryptochrome. Apparently, they've lost cryptochrome. I mean, if you look at plants, flies, all the animals, they have cryptochrome, but the planions lost them. So it's a kind of natural knockout uh, model um, to study magnetoreception. Wow, it so, is very interesting and surprising. It's very surprising. So we're also trying to find what are the uh, mechanism behind the circadian clock because um, you need, um, in order to detect 
Well, in order to synchronize your uh, your clock, your internal mm -hmm. clock, you need these clock genes. But uh, we only know one clock gene in, in Canine, so we're trying to find mechanism um, that um, help to synchronize their, um, their internal clock. Um, Immediately, I have a question to this. Uh, is it possible that living organisms uh, developed different systems for uh, magnetoreception? It's, it's possible. And in fact, some people think that it's a, a cryptochrome based mechanism only. Some people think it's a magnetite based mechanism mm -hmm. only. And some people think it's probably the two um, for different magnetic parameter sensing. Um, having said that, um, looking for magnetite is terribly um, difficult because these are very tiny crystals. They are 20 nanometer in size. So imagine even if, you know, in a bird, it's complicated. So in a, I mean, in a worm, it should be easy. But the way that normally people do it is that they do a slice so that mm -hmm. they stain for iron using the Prussian blue staining, uh, which stains for iron-based material. And then they're going to do uh, ultra-thin sections. Um, and then they will look at the ultra-thin section in TM, in electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. So they're going to do, uh, let's say, a 30 micrometer uh, slice. And if it's Prussian blue positive, they will look at the consecutive semi sections. And then they're gonna move 100 micrometer and they do the same thing and all over again. So imagine a one centimeter worm, good God, you know, it's, it's um, <laughs> you, you need to employ many postdocs and many PhD students to do that. <laughs> so there is an alternative and that's an alternative that I, really wanted to um, do for a long time, for a long time. Um, what you can do, if, you're, if you've got a beam of light uh, energetic enough, uh, you can actually eat the preparation and um, as in normal fluorescent microscope, if you send a photon, um, you collect a lower energy photon. So you can do that with visible light, and that works. But um, if you do with X-ray, mm -hmm. um, you have a lot more information on the nature of the element you have in your preparation. So you can do X-ray fluorescence microscopy uh, for, um, for iron, for example. And if the iron uh, is associated to let's say oxygen, if it forms magnetite, the spectrum uh, will be of a certain shape. So the, the spectrum for magnetite is of a certain shape. The spectrum for um, machemite or hematite is another form. So if you use X-ray, you're able not only to determine which element is present in your um, preparation, but also um, the nature of um, the crystals or the, the, the compound you, you have. Arba, am but, I right that uh, also the sensitivity of this method is much higher than for, for example, for oh, crystal yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. It's a lot more informative. Uh, you you don't need to slice. We didn't need to slice. You get Well, we, we put a slice of worms under it, but, you know, in theory, you could put a whole worms mm -hmm. under it. Do it in we did some, but you, you do some bigger slice. You you don't need to do ultra thin um, slices. Problem is to have a very high energetic um, X ray beam. Uh, you need to go to some places which is called a synchrotron. So what is a synchrotron? Um, it's um, it's no big deal. Let's say uh, in terms of um, uh, explaining how it works is you emit electron and you have an electron beam like uh, in an electron micros uh, mm -hmm. microscope and then um, you send them spinning in a big big loop so in Grenoble for example the size is almost one kilometer uh, circumference so big diameter 
So the electrons are traveling round and round and round and round and round. And then at some point, you give them a little fluctuating magnetic field and they get cross. So when the electron get crossed, they just emit um, what is called a synchrotron radiation, X-ray radiation. And then you use these uh, X-ray beam to uh, hit the preparation. And then when the X-ray photons uh, hit the preparation, um, you collect the, fluor the resulting fluorescence and you get information uh, on your uh, on the element you're looking at. I mean, this is the the, the I think there was a beauty of of being in Grenoble is that people are studying a lot of things. You know, they're studying from like Chinese vase or Chinese pottery. Uh, we're looking worms. Uh, people are looking at paintings. People are looking at all sorts of preparation. So um, you are literally, you are literally, you are making uh, the lives of planaries brighter. <laughs> yes, exactly. You, it, it's um, you, you get bright, and it's also you, you're changing scale in terms of science. You know, I'm a, I'm a, what is called a lab rat, so I like to do pipetting and you know doing electrophysiology. But this is a whole different sort of installation. You go into this installation, you have to be vetted for security. Uh, you have uh, two badges, and uh, you know it's um, it's all level, and also it's 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 huge, it's big. I mean, you imagine a, um, more than a kilometer um, circumference building uh, with almost like I don't know tw twenty or thirty different beam lines. So you've got the the big ring, and then on the side you have all these beam lines, which uh, um conduct high energy uh x-rays and other radiations um better not to stick your hands into the beam <laughs> it's uh uh it's also it's also quite scary at first because you're so you're placing your preparation into uh, the microscope and then you have to do all the safety procedure uh and get out of the room and you know press different button you have different alarms and you know this is also different in terms of safety <laughs> not, not the, emotional experience i guess it's a, it's also a very emotional experience i mean going into that um going into that beam uh into that um into that ring with all the atmosphere around this um it's something i mean you know that you do i, I know that you're doing some poetry you know you you're mm -hmm. poet right yep yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I, you know, there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in being into what I call being in the in, in the belly of the beast. You know, there's a, this hum and it's 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 I, I can't really describe um, precisely um, how, you know, how the whole atmosphere of it. But it's it's certainly, you know, um, a change <laughs> compared to <laughs> the um, transformational experience. Is it's it a, in the middle it, uh, of the room where you have this crazy loop of, inside of this loop uh, electrons uh, have a collision yeah. and well, they, you can manipulate yeah. with this so yeah so um to, to come to the results I mean I don't I don't want of course to spoil and um and also because looking for these cells um there were many uh, uh disappointment but Interestingly, we found some uh, uh, high high ion deposit, some high high ion deposits uh, within a particular region of the worm, which we would not uh, expect. So we found a, a portion of the skin behind the head, uh, very rich in iron, and when we compare the signal um, um, between magnetotactic bacteria, uh, a magnetite standard. And what we found in the back of the worm, it seems that there is a certain match. So we might have found the cell, but you know, we'll we'll need to we'll need to 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 confirm that. But this certainly, you know, I've been looking for this cell for almost. Well, this is already years. a glimpse. Yes. Yeah, uh, we, uh, you know, I've been almost looking for this cell for almost fifteen years. So that that also was a. 
an, an excitement. And I didn't realize it first. I, I didn't realize it was just like, okay, yes, um, there's these cells. And the more, you know, you're just like processing the information. I just, oh, maybe, you know, we put our finger onto, onto something interesting. Um, yeah, and you need a synchrotron. I mean, we were very, very lucky because generally, you know, you apply for this and there's so many, I mean, so much competition that you don't get to use it because it's free. So you, if, you're, if your application is selected, then you're invited for like four or five days. Uh, you know, you have the accommodation there. That's, that's a whole... That's also the whole thing is that you you entering you entering the facility and you don't come out for four or five days. So you're um, you're you're sleeping, eating there and you have to almost work, you know, night and day because you have to load the machine at night and you can come like five hours later to, to see the scan and, and so on. So it's also a particular atmosphere because you you're entering the facility and you coming out of the facility five days later, having done just that, you know. So this is eating. a deep immersion. Sorry? This is a deep immersion. This is, yeah, so, certain, certainly that was that was a bit emotional on my side. Um, mm -hmm. There was a whole this, you know, I'm a, we all nerds, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so the more, the more science and technique we see, it's always, you know, it's always it's always good. Uh, I'm I'm really a sucker for you know technology and and. I, I can relate you with uh, the work that you already have done, and also I would like to discuss uh, the paper that uh, you published two years ago with uh, doctors Bellinger, Banks, by Hartman. And Uwe, Uwe Hartmann. yes, exactly. <laughs> so this is a this is a very interesting uh, work about um, genes that are genes. involved in uh, uh, magnetite biomineralization in the living organisms. And just yes. in brief, you were looking um, for these genes in different organisms, starting from archaea, and you compared uh, genetical materials of different animals. So could you please tell uh, how did you pick up these animals? Uh, how did you come to... I'll, I'll, come up I'll with give you a, 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 a short sort of um, account of that. And if you, if you think, you know, science is easy, this paper is a result of 15 years of collaboration, almost 15 years of collaboration. I first met, uh, yeah, I first met Renee in 2005. Um, I was a young postdoc and she came in the lab uh, in Cambridge and, and, and um, um, she was really enthusiastic about collaborating with us. And it's a, it was a starting point of 15 years. Could you imagine that, you know? And, um, um, before we go into deep science, I think it's a, it's an important message here. You know, interesting science and good science is not something fast. Uh, sometimes it's an adventure. Um, it's long. It's it's hard. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes it produces amazing results. Um, it, it's a not for it's a not for politicians. It's a not for politicians who think it, science is easy and and should get you should get results in two years. Um, no, good science takes time. But um, what do you think? Just immediately, I'm sorry. But what do you think about this? I don't know. Fashion uh, when science uh, is becoming more and more competitive, and when academia is getting more and more toxic, uh, where everyone is looking for immediate results. And we, like everyone who at least try to work uh, in science, we all understand that it is almost impossible. So this is quite a conflicting uh, situation. And the living proof that slow science is probably still possible. <laughs> 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 um, but yes, I mean that's uh, and if you look at at some of the work done by Nobel Prize, some Nobel Prize didn't even publish for five years, six years uh, when they had an idea. And if you look at Darwin, it took him I don't know 
Do you remember how many years it took to, to publish his book? He was withholding his book and, and really making it perfect. Uh, so, yeah, I, I know this is, and with social network and with scientists posting on social network, it's almost insane. Um, I think it's getting maybe fuzzier. I don't know. Uh, if you look at if you look at the work of scientists, you know, back a hundred years ago, there was also a huge pressure to publish. I mean, there was huge competition. Also, I think it's a it's it's a it's a common thing as well. But yes, I'm 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 sure. So to come back to our story, um, basically, you remember the magnetotactic bacteria we talked last time, yes. and. If you look at their genomes in the big uh, in the big chromosome, they have what we call a genomic island. So it's a it's a, pro, it's a portion of the genome where they have all the genes needed to make the magnetite crystals. Um, so the way it works, maybe we we talked about it last time, is that um, you have a, a small protein which acts as a nucleation element. So when you grow a crystal. You need uh, a, a piece of dust or something where the crystal can grow around. If you have grown crystal at home, which I, I suggest that people uh, who are listening do because it's amazing. Um, you just need a, a thread or a, a piece of dust and then the crystal will grow like snow, for example. Um, and then the, the, the bacteria is going to pour iron into the small vesicle called the magnetosomes. Um, and you need some genes to do that. You need iron transport genes. And then all these crystals, um, they are so they're surrounded by a membrane and they align um, um, they align um, on the on a certain axis. And you need cytoskeleton element to make it rigid. So you also mm -hmm. have you also need genes to do that. So Basically, you can have the all these genes are on a small portion of a of a of a genomic what is called a genomic island. It's a small it's a portion of DNA, and the thing is that this portion of DNA can be exchanged uh, between bacteria and even between different species, and you can make yeast magnetic by uh, injecting um, this um, portion of DNA. Um, and it turns out that some of these genes seems highly conserved. I mean, um, if you look at the paper, um, protein by Mam He, for example. I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> you read it. Um, you probably then have better recollection than I do because <laughs> it's been a while. But um, uh, it's um, so basically you can find these genes. Uh, in salmon and other uh, and other species, and so basically the idea was to uh, one of the um, idea in the in the in the in the paper was uh, first what we did was to um, um, take salmon olfactory epithelium, uh, put a magnet on the side of the tissue homogenate, and um, um then you had a, a small lump uh, of tissue sticking to the magnet, uh, taking this bits of cell tissue and analyzed um, the, gen the uh, genes expressed mm -hmm. regarding non-magnetic fraction and look at what are the genes expressed. And then it was um, the second step was to look at the genes and the homology between these genes and the genes present in magnetotactic bacteria and other organisms. And it tends that there were some uh, common genes like MAM-E, for example, uh, associated with a magnetosome formation. So imagine, um, it is so beautiful that uh, inside the bacteria there are genes that control and uh, create uh, the center of crystallization because it, these it, yeah, yeah. When the crystals it, come it, to it's, a, it's amazing because you know we human trying to do nanomaterials you know and it's a pain in the neck it's really a pain in the neck to, to do nanomaterials you need thin room you need all sort of equipment to do that 
Um, whereas this tiny organism, you know, they make magnetic material. Just think, you know, they design, well, they, they're making material that have specific magnetic properties. Um, and magnetic and similar, you know, and similar to each other so there each of these particle is absolutely the same that other particles so yes yeah so they're making um they they're making this um this material with like uh, magnetic properties with physical properties i mean which for a living organism it's i don't know it's um i i think it's intellectually um um challenging to think about it it's uh you know, I'm I'm an organism. I'm gonna make iron um, that is uh, magnetic, uh, ferromagnetic, and then um, I will have some advantages. Um, I don't know if we discussed last time how we think that these magnetic um, properties emerge, but um, yeah, I think we it's quite. Do it. It. We didn't do it, but I think we can do it now, uh, especially. It is important because the conclusion of this paper is that uh, this uh, production of uh, um, materials like magnetite is a very conservative process that starts already in archaea. And archaea yes. is not even a, like, um, I don't know, it's not a bacteria. This is a prototype of bacteria, right? This is, yeah, this is different. This is a different um, branch of life. Of life uh, it, it from it, exactly. and goes already until uh, you know, humans. Yeah. So um, the thing is, it is belief that. Um, so I'm I'm very I'm very bad at dates and and numbers in general. Um, that's the reason why I'm not an historian. I'm a biologist. <laughs> I, I just want to say it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's a usual joke. You know, my students say when I ask my students, oh, why why did you do biology? And they say, because I'm bad at numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what my student um tells me in general. Cruel students. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when we when we're looking at the nuns equation and they seem to suffer that much, and I say, Well, you know, you're a biologist, you should know that. Well, we say, No, we choose biology because we were not good at math. <laughs> but we wanted to do science. <laughs> so um you uh, at some point in the history of of uh, of the earth, um um Photosynthetic organism uh, were uh, producing oxygen, and oxygen has many uh, inconvenience. Uh, it's toxic, and it's also pulled on iron. So iron, uh, when it's not oxidized, is soluble. But when it's oxidized, it tends to uh, to go down. Uh, you have, uh, if you look at strata, you've got what um, they call the um, uh, red layers uh, in some rocks, because it corresponds to this time when photosynthetic organisms started to make oxygen, then you see the iron oxide rust uh, layers. Um, so iron became unavailable uh, for uh, living organism under a soluble form. So they had to find a way of storing iron um, in form of crystals, for example, and it is believed that by doing so, at some point, uh, the organism became magnetic. You know, you can produce many iron oxide, but some are magnetic and some are, let's say, less magnetic. And magnetite is very magnet is very magnetic. It's ferromagnetic, um, and of course, you have uh, you can uh, be aligned in the uh, geomagnetic field lines. So this is an advantage for uh, this is an advantage for um, living organism. And so we we think that it started like that. It it didn't started because the organism wanted to sense the magnetic field. It started because they wanted to have some ion storage vesicles. Is there any uh, opinion about, um, for example, this? Uh, magnetization of living organisms. Is it a consequence that um, our planet has geomagnetic fields or it's just um, 
ra random consequence. The, the, the ability of being able to sense a magnetic field gives the uh, animals or organism uh, uh, an advantage, but it's a, 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 a capacity or ability which came, you know, as a probably, you know, a byproduct of mm -hmm. some of of, uh, of something else. Um, did I tell you the story about Allen Hill meteorite last time? Did we talk no. about meteorite no. controversy? We didn't talk about that. Oh, no. Story about you know, meteorite. <laughs> you know, Vasilisa, I, I'm old. I don't have any memory. Well, I think uh, I have a very bad memory, even young. Um, so th this is a very interesting story. This is a very interesting story. Um, in, um, I think it was in the 80s, um, so, Antarctica is a is a very good place to look at meteorites, because what happened is that um, on a white background you can see black stuff. So, if you're looking at meteorite on Earth, um, go to Antarctica because you'll see the black stuff. If you wander in the streets, um, you know. A, Bit of black rock, it's black rock. Well, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, in the countryside, you can't really uh, spot uh, what is a meteorite uh, from what is something else. So people go to Antarctica and collect uh, meteorite. Turns out, um, and if you follow a bit of mechanics, um, on Earth, you have a lot of Martian meteorites. And the gravity on Mars is not as strong as on Earth. It's one third of um, the Earth. And turns out that if, if there's a big impact on Mars, you're gonna be you're gonna have lots of uh, ejected materials, and this material uh, ejected material um, tend to go towards uh, the inner uh, solar system. And of course, if it meets the Earth, uh, it will uh, fall down on Earth. So on Earth, um, and I know it sound, sounds amazing to think about it, but you have Martian meteorites. And in the 80s, I found uh, near Helen Hill uh, on Antarctica, they found a meteorite. And um, in the 90s, when they analyzed this meteorite, they found two things, two interesting things. They found a little uh, carbon-based global, and they really looked like tiny bacteria. And they also found magnetite. But magne so magnetite, you can find it in geological condition. And in geological condition, it's it's kind of not completely squarish, but it's it's almost like a bit that shape. Whereas in magnetotactic bacteria, it's elongated shape. So the geological magnetite is different in shape from biological magnetite. The, the crystals are, are more elongated. And they found in this meteorite, they found this little um, carbon-based global, uh, carbon-based you know, specks. And they also find magnetite um, and these magnetite crystals were really similar to what you found on Earth. And I don't know, maybe you, you're too young for that, but um, President Clinton um, made an announcement uh, about life on Mars. Uh, it was in the, at the end of the 90s, and um, there, were, there were a lot of um, buzz about that, about this um, Martian meteorite harbor um, and that Mars could harbor life. Uh, because they say, oh, we found these two things uh, in the Martian meteorite. Therefore, in um, you know, Mars history, uh, Mars must have harbored uh, life. Um, okay, that was very exciting. And it turns out that um, in certain condition, you can, uh, in geological condition, you can have this elongated crystal. So people were very enthusiastic and very optimistic at first. And then um, there were a lot of controversy about this Martian meteorite. And now I think the consensus is that probably, you know, it's not no trace of life. But people are still 
um, people are still, you know, thinking and looking at it. And uh, um, also, I think it, it, if you have a magnetic field, it also makes sense to sense it. So um, lots of people think that if you're looking for life or past life on, you know, a different planet, um, it's, it's good to have a magnetic field because it protects you from uh, dangerous radiations. But as a byproduct of that, you might grow some crystal which makes you uh, magnetosensitive. So it's probably a good thing if you're looking at life on another planet to stick a magnet and try to collect some uh, bits of life using using the magnet. Um, especially if you think about Mars, Mars uh, life must have been dispersed. So in order to concentrate life, um, if you, I mean, I'm hoping that people uh, will follow the protocol which I indicate in the, in your last video. But um, actually, if you were, if you were, uh, uh, you know, if you were, sorry, <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> Yesterday uh, arised a lot of questions. First of all, um, is it possible that somehow uh, parts from the Earth occurred uh, on the surface uh, of Mars? So there, there, there's, um, there are out a whole bunch of people who think that, in fact, um, life didn't emerge on Earth first, mm -hmm. and that life emerged on uh, Mars uh, first, and then because of these kind of planet transfer thing, um, the life was transferred from Mars to Earth. Mm -hmm. Um, if you if you're interested in that theory, there's a, a guy um, and he's a, he's actually a good friend of mine, um, Joe Kirschwank. Joe Kirschwank is making conference and he's a really I mean he's a he's a talented scientist. He's got like millions of scientific paper. He's at Caltech. He's a brilliant scientist um, and one of my one of my mentor. Um, and he has the, the following hypothesis. Is that you probably, have you heard about something called the RNA world? Yes. So yes. The, the organisms uh, where, uh, who um, use not DNA to store their information, genetical information, but they use RNA. Because RNA is, uh, um, is a lot, it's a lot easier if you have RNA to uh, auto-replicate molecules. I mean, mm -hmm. RNA is 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 it's a lot easier, and you probably don't need enzyme, and it's it goes almost by itself. Uh, and it is believed that on Mars, the mineral composition and the conditions were a lot more favorable uh, to RNA uh, than it was on initial Earth. And if you think about also um, Mars cooled down earlier. Than Earth probably had water earlier than Earth, um, so all the conditions on Mars were uh, favorable to life. And if you think, of, if you also think about this panspermia um, theory, and I mean, we know now that if you, if you, uh, if we, I mean, when we sample uh, asteroid and space rocks, and um, they have um, all these building blocks for life. Um, so you think that if Mars was bombarded, I mean, we know Mars uh, uh, was bombarded uh, by you know different space rocks. Probably they, you know, they brought building uh, building blocks for life. So it's not that stupid to think that Mars could have harbored life first, uh, and it was transferred uh, onto Earth in second. You know, we all Martian. <laughs> all <laughs> this that. is a very interesting idea. And also, I wanted to ask uh, which uh, organisms uh, uh, can travel in space, for example, on these uh, rocks or, or well, uh, I mean, they, viruses, they did, for example. Do they have yeah, this? I mean, my, I mean, probably bacteria can travel uh Bacteria can travel pretty safe uh, condition in these rocks. I would I would have thought. Uh, I think that I've seen studies where they were projecting 
uh, bacteria uh, embedded in various material, and they survive kind of okay. So, um, you know, why why not? I mean, if you look at um, <laughs> Uh, more evolved organisms like tardigrades, they can survive. They can survive um, um, the vacuum of space, and they can survive radiation. So why not? You know? um, I just came up uh, with a very crazy thing. Is it possible that this magnetoreception as a mechanism was developed by passing the nervous system at all? Since, since it is a very ancient mechanism, it's a, it's a very ancient. It, you don't need you don't need them. You don't need a, a nervous system. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, having said that, there's a lot of controversy in bacteria because lots of people think it's a pure um, passive mechanism, uh, meaning that the bacteria just align uh, on the magnetic field. Um, I think it's it's a, probably a bit more complicated than that. I think. Uh, um, if you move the, the the magnetite, or if you change the condition, then you have some strange things happen that people didn't really explain yet. So, you know, why why not? Why not um, uh, being a bit more active? Uh, mm -hmm. But certainly, I mean, you, you you know, you can do light sensing. You can do all fact well, chemical sensing without a nervous system. And if you look at plants, um, they can do some sensing and of course it's limited by the fact that they have cell walls and etc cetera, etc cetera. but um you can do a bit of sensing without nervous system so you can yes yeah, sense the environment uh, you can the sense the environment plants, and plants produce sense. Some response. Yes. yeah and produce some response plants sense our environment and they um and they communicate to uh, all the cells i mean they can communicate uh, to other cells via electric potentials or or uh, um, gaseous messengers and so on. So uh, and now just donate. And now a very provocative question: Does it mean that uh, plants uh, have uh, intelligence? No. Since they can sense, <laughs> and since they can establish oh, good God. Um, good God. Uh, response. Oh, um, <laughs> the thing is, I've, I had a heat debate with many, many people about that. I mean. You know, I'm a wow. um, I'm a sensory system specialist and a, a more of an animalist. So, um, how can I answer to that? Um, I I think I would escape from this uh, tricky situation. <laughs> you think we need more results, right? <laughs> you know, I think at at that point you should put the Amir Lagbar uh, picture and say it's a trap for uh, for a neuroscientist. <laughs> Um, I did, yeah, I mean, you can sense your environment and you can produce um, a response, but um, in order to integrate different stimuli, um, in order to do complex tasks, task, you need a nervous system. And do you need a uh, free will to do it? <laughs> There's not such a thing as free will. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think free will exists. <laughs> we, we, we just touched a bit uh, this topic about free will um, during the, our last episode. And I would like to go deeper uh, into this topic because um, Robert Sapolsky is a very famous neuroscientist. Uh, this October, he released uh, his new book. And the main idea of this book... I, that... I haven't read it yet. <laughs> But uh, but on, probably but did you? It, it's, on uh, my, did you it's, it's on my interview? it's on my read list. Yeah, it's on my reading list. Did like you hear his things. interviews? Because he has been talking about these books and this idea for two years. We we have free will for two years. <laughs> no, well, no, no. It was <laughs> like he was writing this book for book for uh, two, years, two years, but. And uh, participating in different projects, he talked about uh, his ideas. So his idea was to prove that all our actions are actually based on uh, the biology, on the social environment. And that the conclusion of this, that uh, first of all, each of our action uh, has its cause. And the second is that actually free will doesn't exist. Free will doesn't exist. It's I'm I'm hundred percent convinced about that. 
Um, I've been in 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 the biology swamp for <laughs> for enough years to think that you're a product of your genes, of your environment, of many things. You don't have any control on your actions. Sure. <laughs> I, I'm completely. I, I'm. I'm. I disagree. I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to disagree with this. And uh, um, no, course, I'm being a bit. I'm a being, being I'm a bit a provocative here. I'm a follower of uh, research and uh, research thinking. That's why I'm also a scientist. And of course, our genes, our parents, our social environment, they define uh, many things. They, defi they define our life and how we uh, carry it on. But I think that this is a big uh, difference uh, in humans that we actually can control it at some point. For we example- can control it at some point. I think we have a bit of micro free will, but then, on the whole, we don't have macro free will. I yes, think we might I have agree a bit... that we underestimate the nature that is that behind that is behind uh, uh, of our free will. This is this is the truth. But I wouldn't push it so strongly that we are no, absolutely yeah. uh, independent. You're, you're correct. I was being a bit provocative here, saying that there's not such a thing as free will. We might have a bit of free will, you know, when on the micro scale. Let's say, mm -hmm. um, if I decide to go out, yes, uh, just now and and enjoy the the cold and the sunshine. But on overall, what we're we doing, we are a product of our genes and our experience and social environment. So yeah, free will is limited. Free will is limited, I agree, but also, for example, uh, um, cases uh, with cancer, like patients with cancer, uh, any oncologist uh, knows that it is critically important for them uh, to stay optimistic because they, like any oncologist can uh, tell about uh, cases where patients had a very uh, bad diagnosis, but thankfully to their mood, to their behavior, to their optimism, they somehow could uh, fight the cancer. This is, this is the truth. We still cannot explain how it works, but your, like, your mood, uh, and your state can affect, yeah. yes, can affect and mobilizes all um, immune system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a bit of um, there's a bit of hope. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I sound like a depressed scientist right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sometimes <laughs> it's true, <laughs> but okay, it's fine because I'm an optimist. <laughs> we need to have contrast. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pessimistic optimistic. <laughs> so you are real, realist. <laughs> I'm realistic. <laughs> Do you have uh, some um, uh, science fiction books about space and about space colonization uh, that you? think is very realistic um two um i really like the expense me too yes i fell in love uh, with this book oh, i'm in love with the expense uh i have i have the book in french well i have the books in french the books in english and i have the tv show um kim stanley robinson I think it's called The Red Planet. It's also very realistic. And books by Stephen Baxter. I don't have the, in, the title in English right now in my head, but are um, one of my favorite sort of realistic um, sci-fi, art sci-fi um, authors. Um, I really don't like um, uh, science fantasy and, you know, when it's too, um, there are too many characters and too many people. Mm -hmm. uh, so hard science fiction is good for that because you have a limited amount of, uh, of characters. Uh, when there are too much of characters like Dune, for example, Dune is terrible. You mm -hmm. read the book and you don't remember who is who. <laughs> <laughs> Where was the start? Yes. <laughs> Where is the start? <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> no, no, um, certainly the expense is a big shock. It was a big shock, yeah. Uh, and for me, it was the first book where I found that uh, writers actually thought about um, 
magnetic fields, 3G, how uh, people will live uh, in the absence of G and in the absence of uh, magnetic fields. It was very um, inspiring. It's very, it, it's very realistic and it's it's yeah. it's very sound scientifically. Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, you have the effect of gravity, describe the different physiology of different people living in different environment. Uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's it's really and it's very very well written as well, and it's um it's really good and it's a really good page turner. I know that you have some collaborations with NASA with NASA and other uh, space uh, research agencies. Could you please tell um, what happens with uh, astronauts when they leave the Earth and when they leave uh, geomagnetic? Feels. Do they have some effects on their nervous system and uh, on their health? In Great. Well, I think we will probably need a, another, another talk. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I can summarize that, and maybe uh, later on we can uh, we can develop. So, yeah. in fact, when you leave Earth, um, there are three different parameters which change. Well, many other parameters, but um, three main: gravity. Uh, radiations and low magnetic field. Let's say low magnetic field is not very well known. We know that if you look, if we look at the scientific literature, we know that a magnetic field affect certain biological function like biological rhythm, nociception, etc. Might not be big effect, but we don't know it yet. Um, radiations. Um, <laughs> I'm going to surprise you uh, because when you read in popular science uh, space radiations, people are freaking out about that. They're really freaking out about mm -hmm. that. But if you look at NASA uh, and other space agency, they sort of like, okay, might be dangerous to be in the middle of a solar storm where we can... Um, prevent that and um if i'm uh, a little sort of brackets but it's all about countermeasure and i will develop that um and you could okay if a solar storm happens you can put people in a shielded bunker in a in in the in the spacecraft or so on um so nasa assess so if you go to mars um by uh let's say chemical propulsion um it's six months six nine months then six nine months on site and then a return six nine months um okay will be the risk is equivalent of smoking half a packet of cigarette per day which seems big and you know manageable because you always have countermeasure you can take lots of antioxidant you can have better shielding of spacecraft and space habitat something that uh, we don't do, but like we could use magnetic field to um, shield uh, habitat, and this is something doable. Um, lots of people are working on on that, and, and I'm also part of that secret project. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so by by putting a magnetic field around the spacecraft, you probably shield it. So let's say that space radiation is a is a risk. Uh, because this is not, we're not talking about gamma or X-ray here. We're talking about high energy particle like protons and protons are gonna hit. Um, so they're gonna do damage uh, in a particle part of the brain if they hit it. Um, then, but we, we have countermeasure. Uh, it's probably sort of manageable. Uh, we'll have mutations. Probably it affects reproduction, but we don't know it yet. The big, big, big problem is gravity. Is the absence of gravity because you have a fluid shift, and what happens is that the uh, the fluid tends to go to your head. So uh, when you're in space, uh, the first thing is that you have what we call the fluid shift, that the all the fluid of the body tend to go to the head. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, 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 important pressure uh, of the liquid in the in the brain, uh, and this causes, for example, problem with 
uh, eyesight uh, because the liquid is is pushing the eyes. So uh, astronauts are che are checking um, they are checking their eyes uh, in space flight. So you have lots of liquid, and then your body sort of adapt. And in the second, um, and you see um, when you see astronauts for the first few days uh, in space, they look a bit like puffy. Mm -hmm. A puffy face, and uh, they have a, a fuller cheeks, and so on. So mm -hmm. because they're full of fluid uh, in the uh, uh, upper part, and then the body adapt, and they're gonna uh, pee a lot afterwards, after a week or two, uh, which uh, brings uh, inf urinary tract infections. Um, space is not that glam. It's not that glamour at all. Uh, in I mean, in the current conditions. We will be able to improve these conditions, um, but um, you know, yeah, space for the moment you have to wear nappies, especially during EVAs. Uh, the toilets are not working well. Um, you get these uh, urinary infections um, because you pee a lot uh, um, after two or three weeks. Um, so, it this increase in pressure is a risk for the is certainly a risk. Uh, for the brain. And when you put animals, for example, like mice in space, they come out uh, in um, when you measure the inflammatory mediators, they have lots of uh, inflammatory interleukins express. Um, so you have a sort of low noise inflammatory state, um, probably produced by low gravity. Um, We'll be able to 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 do counter measure for that, and of course, uh, the absence of gravity makes that you are losing muscles, uh, you're losing bones, uh, you're losing bones at a very uh, high pace. Actually, um, if you spend a year in space, you'll probably end up with a with a state with a bone state of a seventy year old, so or eighty year old. Um, of course, when you return on Earth, you're you're able to um, to regrow. A bit more bones. It's reversible, uh, but you when you when you're in space, you need to do a lot of exercise to preserve your your mass and your your muscles, uh, your bones. Uh, you need to the the food needs to be very rich as well. So low gravity is certainly a big. It's a the biggest issue of all, um, certainly. Having said that, you have probably seen um, that. Um, uh, in space movies, they have the uh, um, they have the habitat or the spacecraft turning to mm -hmm. induce artificial gravity. Um, this is something that is doable, but if you do some quick calculations, you need a, a big radius. So you need a big uh, you need a big radius uh, in order to uh, in order to um, uh, in order to reduce um, the gravity to, to have to have gravity and of course what you want is not a gradient so um, because if you if you imagine something turning um, the speed here is not the same as it is if you're here so you need a, a big uh, you need a big radius than the human being being there um, you don't want to feel a, a gradient of gravity you want something mm -hmm. a bit homogeneous so the radius of a turning habitat is about I think two, three hundred meter. So you have a big spinning wheel of three hundred meter. Um, the thing is, it's you could do that because you have you can have a two tethered uh, spacecraft turning. Um, trouble is, the engineers are not very keen on. They don't like turning things um, mm -hmm. for many for many reasons: um, propulsion and communication. Communication is a big issue if your spacecraft is turning, because you always have to turn your spacecraft in a particular direction if you want to communicate with Earth. But if your spacecraft is turning, then uh, the emitting antenna is not aligned with Earth. So engineers don't like this solution. So you have the biologists need to, um, they, um, and you know, other specialists need to push engineers uh, to implement these solutions. Um, another solution is, is to go very fast. So um, um, that might be a surprise, but we can go to Mars a lot faster than uh, with chemical rocket. The uh, alternative is um, thermal, uh, nuclear thermal... Um, Reactions and reactor. Yeah, reactor, yeah. 
Um, and these were developed in the 60s. Um, the American and the Russians developed it. Um, the Americans developed something called NERVA, which um, as a proof of concept works pretty well. And they fired it up in the desert and it worked. Uh, but trouble is, nuclear were, uh, in the 70s and 80s were not that popular. So, and, you know, there was this um, um, big also Cosmos satellite crash in Canada and uh, the, this Russian satellite. And then uh, the Russian had to uh, clean uh, big portions of Canada or give money for Canada to, clean, to do the cleanup. Uh, so nuclear in space is sometimes a bit taboo. Uh, but um, now we have developed, we have sufficient amount of experience to do very safe uh, nuclear reactors. So I think it's not the, it's not that much of a big deal. So with a nuclear propulsion, we could be in we could be in on Mars in 45 days. Um, so you have two alternatives: either you make it long or rotating, or either you make it short and fast. Well, you make it fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the, the second option uh, sounds uh, much more yeah. Uh, convenient. Yeah. So with, with with nuclear with nuclear propulsion, we could already be you know uh, a bit like the expense we fusion uh, uh, fusion reactor uh, would be even better uh, but fission is is good enough for you know, to go to mars in a, in 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 40 days and uh, i was thinking a lot about uh, uh, if uh, humans as a species um will be ready to do uh, long travels in the space. I mean, not because of technical aspects. I mean, because of our, I think, social and cultural aspects. That's a good but, question. And psychological aspects are certainly a big yeah. issue in space. And there's been a lot of work. I mean, if you think about the Russians are um, have pioneered this sort of work. And they have, I think they have put people like in 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 a, a very short space like it would be like three people uh in the equivalent of my office mm -hmm. uh during many months there are a few rules that um people have uh, uh addicted or or um set uh in order for like social isolation and so on and um uh, I'm not going to dwell on much onto these, but for example, something that is striking is put green some plants, and this is this is fantastic. This works very well. If you put people in confined space, put some plants, and they'll be happy. <laughs> but certainly, and the, even even the fact of seeing green stuff uh, improve the mood of people. And another aspect of our behavior is our uh aggressivity i would say because uh for me the my favorite uh, science fiction book about space is uh paradise is lost by ursula Le Guin, okay. and this is a novel about um space travel where people uh, on earth they found finally this exoplanet that is very good uh, to colonization and to immigration but it uh, took uh, uh, six generations to reach this planet and the story is about the third generation so who are in this uh, spacecraft and this is a very interesting story how people start to uh, create different fractions between each other and initially like it was international big goal so they were united with uh, the same uh, goal and purpose and by the end we see these corruptions we see this the change of mood and uh, some people even they just change uh, the uh, total concept of this flight so they made a religion about this so I'm afraid that until we do something with, with our aggression we cannot reach our other spaces this is my uh, big concern yeah. we try to find a way of freezing people or putting them in cryosleep <laughs> 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 Actually, uh, do you have any news about hibernation? Uh, does um, anyone work with this? 
I, I think a lot of people are working on this, probably not for the for the sake of space travel, but for the sake of surgery. For the sake of surgery, I think um, and now, and it's not a, a, a that well known fact, but if you lower the temperature, then surgery is a lot easier. Um, so lots of people are research are, are, are researching on that. I know. Yeah, I not exactly up to speed about them because there have been some recent development, but. Uh, um, I mean, what is clear is that uh, there's a debate in the scientific community if uh, uh, humans are able to hibernate. I mean, probably not, but can we switch on off some genes that will uh, help us to hibernate? You, know, you never know. I, I don't know about that too much, but I know there have been some controversies. Well, this is a good idea. Since we all have uh, genes, for example, hamster, <laughs> so probably <laughs> we can... We can uh, play around it. We can play around it, certainly. <laughs> but again, hamsters are very aggressive. <laughs> so they so are very, very they dangerous. are very, they are very <laughs> aggressive. They are. <laughs> Do you believe in the forms of life that uh, developed without uh, influence of geomagnetic fields? Okay, that's an interesting topic, and that's um. So when I did um. Um, when I did the space school like four years ago, and uh, that was my um, sort of that was my science project that I presented. Um, my conclusion is that uh, life is probably probably needs a magnetic field in order to emerge. That's um, because the magnetic field helps to shelter uh, from dangerous radiations. And if you look at the emergence of life, it's linked with a reinforcement of the geomagnetic field. But if you look at certain places on Earth, uh, you can find life in uh, high radiation environments. Uh, you can find in it, uh, you know that you have some nuclear, natural nuclear reactors uh, in Africa, for example, and you can find uh, micro, micro rural life. Uh, you have uh, micro microorganism which can live in um, pool of nuclear reactors, uh, which are adapted to high radiation environment. So I think um, um, probably magnetic fields on is needed to uh, start life. But I think once life is started, they can find an alternative to cope with high radiation environment. That that is my conclusion. Thank you very much, Herbert. So thank you very final, much, Vasilis. It's been a, a real pleasure. It's a, a very nice discussion, um, as always. Three words, three words. Tell me the three words that uh, led you to neuroscience. Um, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Um, by accident, um, uh, sensory physiology or senses and olfaction. I think olfaction led me first to neuroscience Thank because you. I'm a biophysicist by training. So uh, I, I have I have a PhD in biophysics. So that would that would be my conclusion. <laughs> by accident, by accident. <laughs> a, a famous painter say, and you know how painting is important for me, um, a little happy accident. 